Book Five, Chapter Two of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book Five, Chapter Two, The Amphitheatre. Nydia, assured by the account of Sosia on his return home and satisfied that her letter was in the hands of Salust, gave herself up once more to hope. Salust would surely lose no time in seeking the Praetor, in coming to the house of the Egyptian, in releasing her, in breaking the prison of Calanus. That very night Glaucus would be free. Alas, the night passed, the dawn broke. She heard nothing but the hurried footsteps of the slaves along the hall in Peristyle, and their voices in preparation for the show. By and by, the commanding voice of Arbaces broke on her ear. A flourish of music rung out cheerily. The long procession were sweeping to the amphitheatre to glut their eyes on the death pangs of the Athenian. The procession of Arbaces moved along slowly and with much solemnity till now, arriving at the palace where it was necessary for such as came in litters or chariots to alight, Arbaces descended from his vehicle, and proceeded to the entrance by which the more distinguished spectators were admitted. His slaves, mingling with the humbler crowd, were stationed by officers who received their tickets, not much unlike our modern opera ones, in places in the popularia, the seats apportioned to the vulgar. And now, from the spot where Arbaces sat, his eyes scanned the mighty and impatient crowd that filled the stupendous theatre. On the upper tier, but apart from the male spectators, sat women, their gay dresses resembling some gaudy flower-bed. It is needless to add that they were the most talkative part of the assembly, and many were the looks directed up to them, especially from the benches appropriated to the young and unmarried men. On the lower seats round the arena sat the more high-born and wealthy visitors, the magistrates and those of senatorial or equestrian dignity, the passages which, by corridors at the right and left, gave access to these seats at either end of the oval arena, were also the entrances for the combatants. Strong palings at these passages prevented any unwelcome eccentricity in the movements of the beasts, and confined them to their appointed prey. Around the parapet which was raised above the arena, and from which the seats gradually rose, were gladiatorial inscriptions and paintings wrought in fresco, typical of the entertainments for which the place was designed. Throughout the whole building wound invisible pipes, from which, as the day advanced, cooling and fragrant showers were to be sprinkled over the spectators. The officers of the amphitheatre were still employed in the task of fixing the vast awning, or velaria, which covered the whole, and which luxurious invention the companions arrogated to themselves. It was woven of the whitest Apulian wool, and variegated with broad stripes of crimson. Owing either to some inexperience on the part of the workmen, or to some defect in the machinery, the awning, however, was not arranged that day so happily as usual. Indeed, from the immense space of the circumference, the task was always one of great difficulty and art, so much so that it could seldom be adventured in rough or windy weather. But the present day was so remarkably still that there seemed to the spectators no excuse for the awkwardness of the artificers, and when a large gap in the back of the awning was still visible, from the obstinate refusal of one part of the valeria to ally itself with the rest, the murmurs of discontent were loud in general. The idile Panza, at whose expense the exhibition was given, looked particularly annoyed at the defect, and vowed bitter vengeance on the head of the chief officer of the show, who, fretting, puffing, perspiring, busied himself in idle orders and unavailing threats. The hubbub ceased suddenly, the operators desisted, the crowd were stilled, the gap was forgotten, for now, with a loud and warlike flourish of trumpets, the gladiators, marshalled in ceremonious procession, entered the arena. They swept round the oval space very slowly and deliberately, in order to give the spectators full leisure to admire their stern serenity of feature, 
their brawny limbs and various arms, as well as to form such wagers as the excitement of the moment might suggest. Oh! cried the widow Fulvia to the wife of Panza, as they leaned down from their lofty bench. Do you see that gigantic gladiator? How drolly he is dressed! Yes, said the Idile's wife, with complacent importance, for she knew all the names and qualities of each combatant. He is a retarius or netter. He is armed only, you see, with a three-pronged spear like a trident, and a net. He wears no armor, only the fillet and the tunic. He is a mighty man, and is to fight with Sporus, yon thick-set gladiator, with the round shield and drawn sword, but without body armor. He has not his helmet on now, in order that you may see his face, how fearless it is. By and by he will fight with his visor down. But surely a net and spear are poor arms against a shield and sword? That shows how innocent you are, my dear Fulvia. The Retarius has generally the best of it. But who is yon handsome gladiator, nearly naked? Is it not quite improper? By Venus, but his limbs are beautifully shaped. It is Leiden, a young untried man. He has the rashness to fight yon other gladiator similarly dressed, or rather undressed, tetraides. They fight first in the Greek fashion with the cestus. Afterwards they put on armor and try sword and shield. He is a proper man, this Leiden, and the women, I am sure, are on his side. So are not the experienced betters. Clodius offers three to one against him. Oh, Jove, how beautiful! exclaimed the widow, as two gladiators, armed cap a pied, rode round the arena on light and prancing steeds. Resembling much the combatants in the tilts of the Middle Age, they bore lances and round shields beautifully inlaid. Their armor was woven intricately with bands of iron, but it covered only the thighs and the right arms. Short cloaks, extending to the seat, gave a picturesque and graceful air to their costume. Their legs were naked, with the exception of sandals, which were fastened a little above the ankle. "'Oh, beautiful! Who are these?' asked the widow. "'The one is named Burbix. He has conquered twelve times. The other assumes the arrogant name of Nobilior. They are both Gauls.' While thus conversing, the first formalities of the show were over. To these succeeded a feigned combat with wooden swords between the various gladiators matched against each other. Amongst these, the skill of two Roman gladiators, hired for the occasion, was the most admired, and next to them the most graceful combatant was Leiden. This sham contest did not last above an hour, nor did it attract any very lively interest except among those connoisseurs of the arena to whom art was preferable to more coarse excitement. The body of the spectators were rejoiced when it was over, and when the sympathy rose to terror. The combatants were now arranged in pairs as agreed beforehand, their weapons examined, and the grave sports of the day commenced amidst the deepest silence, broken only by an exciting and preliminary blast of warlike music. It was often customary to begin the sports by the most cruel of all, and some bestiarius, or gladiator appointed to the beasts, was slain first, as an initiatory sacrifice. But in the present instance, the experienced Panza thought it better that the sanguinary drama should advance, not decrease in interest, and accordingly, the execution of Olynthus and Glaucus was reserved for the last. It was arranged that the two horsemen should first occupy the arena, that the foot gladiators, paired off, should then be loosed indiscriminately on the stage, that Glaucus and the lion should next perform their part in the bloody spectacle, and the tiger and the Nazarene be the grand finale. And in the spectacles of Pompeii, the reader of Roman history must limit his imagination, nor expect to find those vast and wholesale exhibitions of magnificent slaughter with which a Nero or a Caligula regaled the inhabitants of the imperial city. The Roman shows, which absorbed the more celebrated gladiators, and the chief portion of foreign beasts, were indeed the very reason why, in the lesser towns of the empire, the sports of the amphitheatre were comparatively humane and rare, and in this, as in other respects, 
pompeii was but the miniature the microcosm of rome still it was an awful and imposing spectacle with which modern times have happily nothing to compare a vast theatre rising row upon row and swarming with human beings from fifteen to eighteen thousand in number intent upon no fictitious representation no tragedy of the stage but an actual victory or defeat the exultant life or the bloody death of each and all who entered the arena the two horsemen were now at either extremity of the lists if so they might be called and at a given signal from panza the combatants started simultaneously as in full collision each advancing his round buckler each poising on high his light yet sturdy javelin but just when within three paces of his opponent the steed of burbix suddenly halted wheeled round and as nobilior was borne rapidly by his antagonist spurred upon him the buckler of nobilior quickly and skilfully extended received a blow which otherwise would have been fatal well done nobilior cried the praetor giving the first vent to the popular excitement bravely struck my burbix answered clodius from his seat and the wild murmur swelled by many a shout echoed from side to side the visors of both the horsemen were completely closed like those of the knights in after times but the head was nevertheless the great point of assault and nobilior now wheeling his charger with no less adroitness than his opponent directed his spear full on the helmet of his foe burbix raised his buckler to shield himself and his quick-eyed antagonist suddenly lowering his weapon pierced him through the breast burbix reeled and fell nobilior nobilior shouted the populace i have lost ten sesterdia said clodius between his teeth habit he has it said panza deliberately the populace not yet hardened into cruelty made the signal of mercy but as the attendants of the arena approached they found the kindness came too late the heart of the gaul had been pierced and his eyes were set in death it was his life's blood that flowed so darkly over the sand and sawdust of the arena it is a pity it was so soon over there was little enough for one's trouble said the widow fulvia yes i have no compassion for burbix any one might have seen that nobilior did but faint mark they fix the fatal hook to the body they drag him away to the spoliarium they scatter new sand over the stage panza regrets nothing more than that he is not rich enough to strew the arena with borax and cinnabar as nero used to do well if it had been a brief battle it is quickly succeeded see my handsome leiden in the arena i and the net-bearer too and the swordsmen oh charming there were now on the arena six combatants niger and his net matched against sporus with his shield and his short broadsword leiden and tetraides naked save by a cincture round the waist each armed only with a heavy greek cestus and two gladiators from rome clad in complete steel and evenly matched with immense bucklers and pointed swords the initiatory contest between leiden and tetraides being less deadly than that between the other combatants no sooner had they advanced to the middle of the arena than as by common assent the rest held back to see how that contest should be decided and wait till fiercer weapons might replace the cestus ere they themselves commenced hostilities they stood leaning on their arms and apart from each other gazing on the show which if not bloody enough thoroughly to please the populace they were still inclined to admire because its origin was of their ancestral greece no person could at first glance have seemed less evenly matched than the two antagonists tetraides though not taller than leiden weighed considerably more the natural size of his muscles was increased to the eyes of the vulgar by masses of solid flesh for as it was a notion that the contest of the cestus fared easiest with him who was plumpest tetraides had encouraged to the utmost his hereditary predisposition to the portly his shoulders were vast and his lower limbs thick-set double-jointed and slightly curved outward 
in that formation which takes so much from beauty to give so largely to strength but leyden except that he was slender even almost to meagreness was beautifully and delicately proportioned and the skilful might have perceived that with much less compass of muscle than his foe that which he had was more seasoned iron and compact in proportion too as he wanted flesh he was likely to possess activity and a haughty smile on his resolute face which strongly contrasted the solid heaviness of his enemies gave assurance to those who beheld it and united their hope to their pity so that despite the disparity of their seeming strength the cry of the multitude was nearly as loud for leyden as for tetraides whoever is acquainted with modern prize ring whoever has witnessed the heavy and disabling strokes which the human fist skilfully directed hath the power to bestow may easily understand how much that happy facility would be increased by a band carried by thongs of leather round the arm as high as the elbow and terribly strengthened about the knuckles by a plate of iron and sometimes a plummet of lead yet this which was meant to increase perhaps rather diminished the interest of the fray for it necessarily shortened its duration a very few blows successfully and scientifically planted might suffice to bring the contest to a close and the battle did not therefore often allow full scope for the energy fortitude and dogged perseverance that we technically style pluck which not unusually wins the day against superior science and which heightens to so painful a delight the interest in the battle and the sympathy for the brave guard thyself growled tetraides moving nearer and nearer to his foe who rather shifted round him than receded leyden did not answer save by a scornful glance of his quick vigilant eye tetraides struck it was the blow of a smith on a vice leyden sank suddenly on one knee the blow passed over his head not so harmless was leyden's retaliation he quickly sprung to his feet and aimed his cestus full on the broad chest of his antagonist tetraides reeled the populace shouted you are unlucky to-day said lepidus to clodius you have lost one bet you will lose another by the gods my bronzes go to the auctioneer if that is the case i have no less than a hundred sesteria upon tetraides ha ha see how he rallies that was a home stroke he has cut open leyden's shoulder a tetraides a tetraides but leyden is not disheartened by pollux how well he keeps his temper see how dexterously he avoids those hammer-like hands dodging now here now there circling round and round ah poor leyden he has it again three to one still on tetraides what say you lepidus well nine sesterdia to three be it so what again leyden he stops he gasps for breath by the gods he is down no he is again on his legs brave leyden tetraides is encouraged he laughs loud he rushes on him fool success blinds him he should be cautious leyden's eye is like the lynx's said clodius between his teeth ha clodius you saw that your man totters another blow he falls he falls earth revives him then he is once more up but the blood rolls down his face by the thunderer leyden wins it see how he presses on him that blow on the temple would have crushed an ox it has crushed tetraides he falls again he cannot move habit 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 repeated panza take them out and give them the armor and swords noble editor said the officers we fear that tetraides will not recover in time howbeit we will try do so in a few minutes the officers who had dragged off the stunned and insensible gladiator returned with rueful countenances they feared for his life he was utterly incapacitated from re-entering the arena in that case said panza hold leyden a subditious and the first gladiator that is vanquished let leyden supply his place with the victor the people shouted their applause at this sentence 
then they again sunk into deep silence the trumpet sounded loudly the four combatants stood each against each in prepared and stern array dost thou recognize the romans my clodius are they among the celebrated or are they merely ordinary eumolpus is a good second-rate swordsman my lepidus nepimus the lesser man i have never seen before but he is the son of one of the imperial fiscales and brought up in a proper school doubtless they will show sport but i have no heart for the game i cannot win back my money i am undone curses on that leyden who could have supposed he was so dexterous or so lucky well clodius shall i take compassion on you and accept your own terms with these romans and even ten sesterdia on eumolpus then what when nepimus is untried nay nay that is too bad well ten to eight agreed while the contest in the amphitheatre had thus commenced there was one in the loftier benches for whom it had assumed indeed a poignant and stifling interest the aged father of leyden despite his christian horror of the spectacle in his agonized anxiety for his son had not been able to resist being the spectator of his fate one amidst a fierce crowd of strangers the lowest rabble of the populace the old man saw felt nothing but the form the presence of his brave son not a sound had escaped his lips when twice he had seen him fall to the earth only he turned paler and his limbs trembled but he had uttered one low cry when he saw him victorious unconscious alas of the more fearful battle to which the victory was but a prelude my gallant boy said he and wiped his eyes is he thy son said a brawny fellow to the right of the nazarene he has fought well let us see how he does by and by hark he is to fight the first victor now old boy pray the gods that that victor be neither of the romans nor next to them the giant niger the old man sat down again and covered his face the fray for the moment was indifferent to him leyden was not one of the combatants yet yet the thought flashed across him the fray was indeed of deadly interest the first who fell was to make way for leyden he started and bent down with straining eyes and clasped hands to view the encounter the first interest was attracted towards the combat of niger with sporus for this species of contest from the fatal result which usually attended it and from the great science it required in either antagonist was always peculiarly inviting to the spectators they stood at a considerable distance from each other the singular helmet which sporus wore the visor of which was down concealed his face but the features of niger attracted a fearful and universal interest from their compressed and vigilant ferocity thus they stood for some moments each eyeing each till sporus began slowly and with great caution to advance holding his sword pointed like a modern fencer's at the breast of his foe niger retreated as his antagonist advanced gathering up his net with his right hand and never taking his small glittering eye from the movements of the swordsman. Suddenly, when Sporius had approached nearly at arm's length, the Retiarius threw himself forward and cast his net. A quick inflection of body saved the gladiator from the deadly snare. He uttered a sharp cry of joy and rage and rushed upon Niger. But Niger had already drawn in his net, thrown it across his shoulders, and now fled round the lists with a swiftness which the secutor in vain endeavoured to equal the people laughed and shouted aloud to see the ineffectual efforts of the broad-shouldered gladiator to overtake the flying giant when at that moment their attention was turned from these to the two roman combatants they had placed themselves at the onset face to face at the distance of modern fencers from each other but the extreme caution which both evinced at first had prevented any warmth of engagement and allowed the spectators full leisure to interest themselves in the battle between sporus and his foe but the romans were now heated into full and fierce encounter they pushed returned advanced on retreated from each other with all that careful yet scarcely perceptible caution which characterizes men well experienced and equally matched 
but at this moment eumolpus the elder gladiator by that dexterous backstroke which was considered in the arena so difficult to avoid had wounded nepimus in the side the people shouted lepidus turned pale ho said clodius the game is nearly over if eumolpus fights now the quiet fight the other will gradually bleed himself away but thank the gods he has not fight the backward fight see he presses hard upon nepimus by mars but nepimus had him there the helmet rang again clodius i shall win why do i ever bet but at the dice groaned clodius to himself or why cannot one cog a gladiator asporus asporus shouted the populace as niger having now suddenly paused had again cast his net and again unsuccessfully he had not retreated this time with sufficient agility the sword of sporus had inflicted a severe wound upon his right leg and incapacitated to fly he was pressed hard by the fierce swordsman his great height and length of arm still continued however to give him no despicable advantages and steadily keeping his trident at the front of his foe he repelled him successfully for several minutes sporus now tried by great rapidity of evolution to get round his antagonist who necessarily moved with pain and slowness in so doing he lost his caution he advanced too near to the giant raised his arm to strike and received the three points of the fatal spear full in his breast he sank on his knee in a moment more the deadly net was cast over him he struggled against its meshes in vain again 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 he writhed mutely beneath the fresh strokes of the trident his blood flowed fast through the net and redly over the sand he lowered his arms in acknowledgment of defeat the conquering retiarius withdrew his net and leaning on his spear looked to the audience for their judgment slowly too at the same moment the vanquished gladiator rolled his dim and despairing eyes around the theatre from row to row from bench to bench there glared upon him but merciless and unpitying eyes hushed was the roar the murmur the silence was dread for it was no sympathy not a hand no not even a woman's hand gave the signal of charity and life sporus had never been popular in the arena and lately the interest of the combatant had been excited on behalf of the wounded niger the people were warmed into blood the mimic fight had ceased to charm the interest had mounted up to the desire of sacrifice and the thirst of death the gladiator felt that his doom was sealed he uttered no prayer no groan the people gave the signal of death in dogged but agonized submission he bent his neck to receive the fatal stroke and now as the spear of the retarius was not a weapon to inflict instant and certain death there stalked into the arena a grim and fatal form brandishing a short sharp sword and with features utterly concealed beneath his visor with slow and measured steps this dismal headsman approached the gladiator still kneeling laid the left hand on his humbled crest drew the edge of the blade across his neck turned round to the assembly lest in the last moment remorse should come upon them the dread signal continued the same the blade glittered brightly in the air fell and the gladiator rolled upon the sand his limbs quivered were still he was a corpse his body was dragged at once from the arena through the gate of death and thrown into the gloomy den termed technically the spoliarium and ere it had well reached that destination the strife between the remaining combatants was decided the sword of eumolpus had inflicted the death wound upon the less experienced combatant a new victim was added to the receptacle of the slain throughout that mighty assembly there now ran a universal movement the people breathed more freely and resettled themselves in their seats a grateful shower was cast over every row from the concealed conduits in cool and luxurious pleasure they talked over the late spectacle of blood eumolpus removed his helmet and wiped his brows his close-curled hair and short beard 
his noble roman features and bright dark eye attracted the general admiration he was fresh unwounded unfatigued the editor paused and proclaimed aloud that as niger's wound disabled him from again entering the arena leyden was to be the successor to the slaughtered nepimus and the new combatant of eumolpus yet leyden added he if thou wouldst decline the combat with one so brave and tried thou mayst have full liberty to do so eumolpus is not the antagonist that was originally decreed for thee thou knowest best how far thou canst cope with him if thou failest thy doom is honourable death if thou conquerest out of my own purse i will double the stipulated prize the people shouted applause leyden stood in the lists he gazed around high above he beheld the pale face the straining eyes of his father he turned away irresolute for a moment no the conquest of the cestus was not sufficient he had not yet won the prize of victory his father was still a slave noble idele he replied in a firm and deep tone i shrink not from this combat for the honour of pompey i demand that one trained by its long celebrated lanista shall do battle with this roman the people shouted louder than before four to one against leyden said clodius to lepidus i would not take twenty to one why eumolpus is a very achilles and this poor fellow is but a tyro eumolpus gazed hard at the face of leyden he smiled yet the smile was followed by a slight and scarce audible sigh a touch of compassionate emotion which custom conquered the moment the heart acknowledged it and now both clad in complete armour the sword drawn the visor closed the two last combatants of the arena ere man at least was matched with beast stood opposed to each other it was just at this time that a letter was delivered to the praetor by one of the attendants of the arena he removed the cincture glanced over it for a moment his countenance betrayed surprise and embarrassment he re-read the letter and then muttering tush it is impossible the man must be drunk even in the morning to dream of such follies threw it carelessly aside and gravely settled himself once more in the attitude of attention to the sports the interest of the public was wound up very high eumolpus had at first won their favour but the gallantry of leyden and his well-timed allusion to the honour of the pompeian lanista had afterwards given the latter the preference in their eyes hola old fellow said medan's neighbour to him your son is hardly matched but never fear the editor will not permit him to be slain no nor the people neither he has behaved too bravely for that ha that was a home thrust well averted by pollux at him again leyden they stopped to breathe what art thou muttering old boy prayers answered medan with a more calm and hopeful mien than he had yet maintained prayers trifles the time for gods to carry a man away in a cloud is gone now ha jupiter what a blow thy side thy side take care of thy side leyden there was a compulsive tremor throughout the assembly a fierce blow from eumolpus full on the crest had brought leyden to his knee have it he has it cried a shrill female voice he has it it was the voice of the girl who had so anxiously anticipated the sacrifice of some criminal to the beasts be silent child said the wife of panza haughtily non habit he is not wounded i wish he were if only to spite old surly medan muttered the girl meanwhile leyden who had hitherto defended himself with great skill and valour began to give way before the vigorous assaults of the practised roman his arm grew tired his eye dizzy he breathed hard and painfully the combatants paused again for breath young man said eumolpus in a low voice desist i will wound thee slightly then lower thy arms thou hast propitiated the editor and the mob thou wilt be honourably saved 
and my father still enslaved groaned leyden to himself no death or his freedom at that thought and seeing that his strength not being equal to the endurance of the roman everything depended on a sudden and desperate effort he threw himself fiercely on eumolpus the roman warily retreated leyden thrust again eumolpus drew himself aside the sword grazed his cuirass leyden's breast was exposed the roman plunged his sword through the joints of the armor not meaning however to inflict a deep wound leyden weak and exhausted fell forward fell right on the point it passed through and through even to the back eumolpus drew forth his blade leyden still made an effort to regain his balance his sword left his grasp he struck mechanically at the gladiator with his naked hand and fell prostrate on the arena with one accord editor and assembly made the signal of mercy the officers of the arena approached they took off the helmet of the vanquished he still breathed his eyes rolled fiercely on his foe the savageness he had acquired in his calling glared from his gaze and lowered upon the brow darkened already with the shades of death then with a convulsive groan with a half start he lifted his eyes above they rested not on the face of the editor nor on the pitying brows of his relenting judges he saw them not they were as if the vast space was desolate and bare one pale agonizing face alone was all he recognized one cry of a broken heart was all that amidst the murmurs and the shouts of the populace reached his ear the ferocity vanished from his brow a soft a tender expression of sanctifying but despairing love played over his features played waned darkened his face suddenly became locked and rigid resuming its former fierceness he fell upon the earth look to him said the ideale he has done his duty the officers dragged him off to the spoliarium a true type of glory and of its fate murmured arbaces to himself and his eye glancing round the amphitheatre betrayed so much of disdain and scorn that whoever encountered it felt his breath suddenly arrested and his emotions frozen into one sensation of abasement and of awe again rich perfumes were wafted around the theatre the attendants sprinkled fresh sand over the arena bring forth the lion and glaucus the athenian said the editor and a deep and breathless hush of overwrought interest and intense yet strange to say not unpleasing terror lay like a mighty and awful dream over the assembly End of Book 5, Chapter 2book five chapter three of last days of pompeii this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. last days of pompeii by edward g bulver lytton book five chapter three sallust and nidia's letter thrice had sallust awakened from his morning sleep and thrice, recollecting that his friend was that day to perish, had he turned himself with a deep sigh once more to court oblivion. His sole object in life was to avoid pain, and where he could not avoid, at least to forget it. At length, unable any longer to steep his consciousness in slumber, he raised himself from his incumbent posture, and discovered his favorite freedman sitting by his bedside as usual, for Sallust, who, as I have said, had a gentleman-like taste for the polite letters, was accustomed to be read to for an hour or so previous to his rising in the morning. No books to-day, no more Tibullus, no more Pindar for me, Pinda, alas, alas! The very name recalls those games to which our arena is the savage successor. Has it begun, the amphitheatre? Are its rites commenced? Long since, O Sallust, did you not hear the trumpets and the trampling feet? Ay, ay, but the gods be thanked, I was drowsy, 
and had only to turn round to fall asleep again. The gladiators must have been long in the ring. The wretches! None of my people have gone to the spectacle. Assuredly not. Your orders were too strict. That is well. Would the day were over. What is that letter yonder on the table? That? Oh, the letter brought to you last night, when you were too, uh, too... Drunk to read it, I suppose. No matter, it cannot be of much importance. Shall I open it for you, Sallust? Do. Anything to divert my thoughts. Poor Glaucus. The freedman opened the letter. What? Greek? said he. Some learned lady, I suppose. He glanced over the letter, and for some moments the irregular lines traced by the blind girl's hand puzzled him. Suddenly, however, his countenance exhibited emotion and surprise. "'Good gods! Noble Celest! What have we done not to attend to this before? Hear me read!' "'Nidia, the slave, to Celest, the friend of Glaucus. I am a prisoner in the house of Arbaces. Hasten to the praetor, procure my release, and we shall yet save Glaucus from the lion. There is another prisoner within these walls.' whose witness can exonerate the Athenian from the charge against him, one who saw the crime, who can prove the criminal and a villain hitherto unsuspected. Fly, hasten, quick, quick! Bring with you armed men, lest resistance be made, and a cunning and dexterous smith, for the dungeon of my fellow prisoner is thick and strong. O oh, by thy right hand, and thy father's ashes, lose not a moment! Great Joe! exclaimed Salus, starting. And this day, nay, within this hour perhaps he dies. What is to be done? I will instantly to the praetor. Nay, not so. The praetor, as well as Pansa, the editor himself, is the creature of the mob, and the mob will not hear of delay. They will not be balked in the very moment of expectation. Besides, the publicity of the appeal would forewarn the cunning Egyptian. It is evident that he has some interest in these concealments, no, fortunately thy slaves are in thy house. I see the meaning, interrupted Sallust. Arm the slaves instantly. The streets are empty. We will ourselves hasten to the house of Arbaces and release the prisoners. Quick, quick, what ho, thou was there. My gown and sandals, the papyrus and the reed. I will write to the praetor to beseech him to delay the sentence of Glaucus, for that within an hour we may yet prove him innocent. So, so, that is well. Hasten with this Davos to the praetor, at the amphitheatre. See it given to his own hand. Now then, O ye gods, whose providence Epicurus denied, befriend me, and I will call Epicurus a liar. End of chapter 3「Book Five, Chapter Four of the Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book Five, Chapter Four. The Amphitheatre Once More. Glaucus and Olynthus had been placed together in that gloomy and narrow cell in which the criminals of the arena awaited their last and fearful struggle. Their eyes, of late accustomed to the darkness, scanned the faces of each other in this awful hour, and by that dim light, the paleness, which chased away the natural hues from either cheek, assumed a yet more ashy and ghastly whiteness. Yet their brows were erect and dauntless, their limbs did not tremble, their lips were compressed and rigid. The religion of the one, the pride of the other, the conscious innocence of both, and, it may be, the support derived from their mutual companionship, elevated the victim into the hero. Hark, hearest thou that shout? They are growling over their human blood, said Olynthus. I hear. My heart grows sick, but the gods support me. The gods, O rash young man, in this hour recognize only the one God. 
Have I not taught thee in the dungeon, wept for thee, prayed for thee? In my zeal and in my agony, have I not thought more of thy salvation than my own? Brave friend, answered Glaucus solemnly, I have listened to thee with awe, with wonder, and with a secret tendency towards conviction. Had our lives been spared, I might gradually have weaned myself from the tenets of my own faith, and inclined to thine. But, in this last hour it were a craven thing, and a base, to yield to hasty terror what should only be the result of lengthened meditation. Were I to embrace thy creed, and cast down my father's gods, should I not be bribed by thy promise of heaven, or awed by thy threats of hell? Olynthus, no. Think we of each other with equal charity, I honoring thy sincerity, thou pitying my blindness or my obdurate courage. As have been my deeds, such will be my reward, and the power or powers above will not judge harshly of human error, when it is linked with honesty of purpose and truth of heart. Speak we no more of this. Hush! Dost thou hear them drag yon heavy body through the passage? Such as that clay will be ours soon. O heaven! O Christ! Already I behold ye, cried the fervent Olynthus, lifting up his hands. I tremble not. I rejoice that the prison house shall soon be broken. Glaucus bowed his head in silence. He felt the distinction between his fortitude and that of his fellow sufferer. The heathen did not tremble, but the Christian exulted. The door swung gratingly back. The gleam of spears shot along the walls. Glaucus the Athenian, thy time has come said a loud and clear voice. The lion awaits thee. I am ready, said the Athenian. Brother and co-mate, one last embrace. Bless me and farewell. The Christian opened his arms. He clasped the young heathen to his breast. He kissed his forehead and cheek. He sobbed aloud. His tears flowed fast and hot over the features of his new friend. Oh, could I have converted thee? I had not wept. Oh, that I might say to thee, We too shall sup this night in paradise. It may be so yet, answered the Greek, with a tremulous voice. They whom death part not may meet yet beyond the grave, on the earth, on the beautiful, the beloved earth. Farewell forever. Worthy officer, I attend you. Glaucus tore himself away, and when he came forth into the air, its breath, which, though sunless, was hot and arid, smote witheringly upon him. His frame, not yet restored from the effects of the deadly draught, shrank and trembled. The officers supported him. Courage, said one, thou art young, active, well-knit. They give thee a weapon, despair not, and thou mayest yet conquer. Glaucus did not reply, but, ashamed of his infirmity, he made a desperate and convulsive effort and regained the firmness of his nerves. They anointed his body, completely naked, saved by a cincture round his loins, placed a stylus, vain weapon, in his hand, and led him into the arena. And now, when the Greek saw the eyes of thousands and tens of thousands upon him, he no longer felt that he was mortal. All evidence of fear, all fear itself, was gone. A red and haughty flush spread over the paleness of his features. He towered aloft to the full of his glorious stature. In the elastic beauty of his limbs and form, in his intent but unfrowning brow, in the high disdain, and in the indomitable soul, which breathed visibly, which spoke audibly, from his attitude, his lip, his eye, he seemed the very incarnation, vivid and corporeal, of the valor of his land of the divinity of its worship, at once a hero and a god. The murmur of hatred and horror at his crime, which had greeted his entrance, died into the silence of involuntary admiration and half-compassionate respect, and with a quick and convulsive sigh that seemed to move the whole mass of life as if it were one body, the gaze of the spectators turned from the Athenian to a dark, uncouth object in the center of the arena. It was the grated den of the lion. By Venus, how warm it is, said Fulvia. Yet there is no sun. 
would that those stupid sailors could have fastened up that gap in the awning. Oh, it is warm, indeed. I turn sick, I faint, said the wife of Panza, even her experienced stoicism giving way at the struggle about to take place. The lion had been kept without food for twenty-four hours, and the animal had, during the whole morning, testified a singular and restless uneasiness, which the keeper had attributed to the pangs of hunger. Yet its bearing seemed rather that of fear than of rage. Its roar was painful and distressed. It hung its head, snuffed the air through the bars, then lay down, started again, and again uttered its wild and far-resounding cries. And now, in its den, it lay utterly dumb and mute, with distended nostrils forced hard against the grating, and disturbing with a heaving breath the sand below on the arena. The editor's lip quivered, his cheek grew pale, he looked anxiously around, hesitated, delayed. The crowd became impatient. Slowly he gave the sign. The keeper, who was behind the den, cautiously removed the grating and the lion leaped forth with a mighty and glad roar of release. The keeper hastily retreated through the grated passage leading from the arena, and left the lord of the forest and his prey. Glaucus had bent his limbs so as to give himself the firmest posture at the expected rush of the lion, with his small and shining weapon raised on high, in the faint hope that one well-directed thrust, for he knew that he should have time for but one, might penetrate through the eye to the brain of his grim foe. But, to the unalterable astonishment of all, the beast seemed not even aware of the presence of the criminal. At the first moment of its release it halted abruptly in the arena. It raised itself half on end, snuffing the upward air with impatient sighs. Then suddenly it sprang forward, but not on the Athenian. At half speed it circled round and round the space, turning its vast head from side to side with an anxious and perturbed gaze, as if seeking only some avenue of escape. Once or twice it endeavored to leap up the parapet that divided it from the audience, and, on failing, uttered rather a baffled howl than its deep-toned and kingly roar. It evinced no sign, either of wrath or hunger. Its tail drooped along the sand, instead of lashing its gaunt sides, and its eye, though it wandered at times to Glaucus, rolled again listlessly from him. At length, as if tired of attempting to escape, it crept with a moan into its cage, and once more laid itself down to rest. The first surprise of the assembly at the apathy of the lion soon grew converted into resentment at its cowardice, and the populace already merged their pity for the fate of Glaucus into angry compassion for their own disappointment. The editor called to the keeper. How is this? Take the goad, prick him forth, and then close the door of the den. As the keeper, with some fear but more astonishment, was preparing to obey, a loud cry was heard at one of the entrances of the arena. There was a confusion, a bustle, voices of remonstrance suddenly breaking forth, and suddenly silenced at the reply. All eyes turned in wonder at the interruption towards the quarter of the disturbance. The crowd gave way, and suddenly Sallust appeared on the senatorial benches, his hair disheveled, breathless, heated, half-exhausted. He cast his eyes hastily round the ring. "'Remove the Athenian!' he cried. "'Haste! He is innocent! Arrest Arbaces the Egyptian! He is the murderer of Apicides!' "'Art thou mad, O Sallust?' said the praetor, rising from his seat. What means this raving? Remove the Athenian, quick, or his blood be on your head. Praetor, delay, and you answer with your own life to the emperor. I bring with me the eyewitness to the death of the priest Apicides. Room there, stand back, give way, people of Pompeii, fix every eye upon Arbaces, there he sits. Room there for the priest Calenus. Pale, haggard, Fresh from the jaws of famine and of death, his face fallen, his eyes dull as a vulture's, his broad frame gaunt as a skeleton. Calenus was supported into the very row in which Arbaces sat. His releasers had given him sparingly of food, but the chief sustenance that nerved his feeble limbs was revenge. 
the priest Calenus. Calenus, cried the mob, is it he? No, it is a dead man. It is the priest Calenus, said the praetor gravely. What hast thou to say? Arbaces of Egypt is the murder of Apicides, the priest of Isis. These eyes saw him deal the blow. It is from the dungeon into which he plunged me, it is from the darkness and horror of a death by famine, that the gods have raised me to proclaim his crime. Release the Athenian, he is innocent. It is for this, then, that the lion spared him. A miracle! A miracle! cried Panza. A miracle! A miracle! shouted the people. Remove the Athenian! Arbaces to the lion! And that shout echoed from hill to vale, from coast to sea. Arbaces to the lion! Officers, remove the accused Glaucus. Remove, but guard him yet, said the praetor. The gods lavish their wonders upon this day. As the praetor gave the word of release, there was a cry of joy, a female voice, a child's voice, and it was of joy. It rang through the heart of the assembly with electric force. It was touching. It was holy, that child's voice and the populace echoed it back with sympathizing congratulation. Silence, said the grave praetor. Who is there? The blind girl, Nydia, answered Sallust. It is her hand that has raised Calenus from the grave and delivered Glaucus from the lion. Of this hereafter, said the praetor. Calenus, priest of Isis, thou accusest Arbaces of the murder of Apicides? I do. Thou didst behold the deed? Praetor, with these eyes. Enough at present. The details must be reserved for more suiting time and place. Arbaces of Egypt, thou hearest the charge against thee. Thou hast not yet spoken. What hast thou to say? The gaze of the crowd had long been riveted on Arbaces, but not until the confusion which he had betrayed at the first charge of Sallust and the entrance of Calenus had subsided. At the shout, Arbaces to the lion, he had indeed trembled, and the dark bronze of his cheek had taken a paler hue. But he had soon recovered his haughtiness and self-control. Proudly he returned the angry glare of the countless eyes around him, and replying now to the question of the praetor, he said, in that accent so peculiarly tranquil and commanding, which characterized his tones. Praetor, this charge is so mad that it scarcely deserves reply. My first accuser is the noble Sallust, the most intimate friend of Glaucus. My second is a priest. I revere his garb and calling. But, people of Pompeii, ye know somewhat of the character of Calenus. He is gripping and gold-thirsty to a proverb. The witness of such men is to be bought. Praetor, I am innocent. Sallust, said the magistrate, where found you Calenus? In the dungeons of Arbaces. Egyptian, said the praetor, frowning, thou didst then dare to imprison a priest of the gods? And wherefore? Hear me, answered Arbaces, rising calmly, but with agitation visible on his face. This man came to threaten that he would make against me the charge he has now made, unless I would purchase his silence with half my fortune. I remonstrated, in vain. Peace there, let not the priest interrupt me. Noble praetor, and ye, O people, I was a stranger in the land, I knew myself innocent of crime. But the witness of a priest against me might yet destroy me. In my perplexity I decoyed him into the cell whence he had been released, on the pretense that it was the coffer-house of my gold. I resolved to detain him there until the fate of the true criminal was sealed and his threats could avail no longer. But I meant no worse. I may have erred, but who amongst ye will not acknowledge the equity of self-preservation? Were I guilty, why was the witness of this priest silent at the trial? Then I had not detained or concealed him. Why did he not proclaim my guilt when I proclaimed that of Glaucus? Praetor, this needs an answer. For the rest, I throw myself on your laws. I demand their protection. Remove hence the accused and the accuser. I will willingly meet, and cheerfully abide by, the decision of the legitimate tribunal. This is no place for further parley. He says right, said the praetor. Ho, guards, 
Remove Arbaces. Guard Calenus. Sallust, we hold you responsible for your accusation. Let the sports be resumed. What? cried Calenus, turning round to the people. Shall Isis be thus contemned? Shall the blood of Apicides yet cry for vengeance? Shall justice be delayed now, that it may be frustrated hereafter? Shall the lion be cheated of his lawful prey? A god! A god! I feel the god rush to my lips. To the lion! To the lion with arbaces! His exhausted frame could support no longer the ferocious malice of the priest. He sank on the ground in strong convulsions. The foam gathered to his mouth. He was as a man, indeed, whom a supernatural power had entered. People saw and shuddered. It is a god that inspires the holy man. To the lion with the Egyptian. With that cry up sprang, on moved, thousands upon thousands. They rushed from the heights. They poured down in the direction of the Egyptian. In vain did the Edile command. In vain did the Praetor lift his voice and proclaim the law. The people had been already rendered savage by the exhibition of blood. They thirsted for more. Their superstition was aided by their ferocity. Aroused, inflamed by the spectacle of their victims, they forgot the authority of their rulers. It was one of those dread popular convulsions common to crowds wholly ignorant, half free and half servile, and which the peculiar constitution of the Roman provinces so frequently exhibited. The power of the praetor was as a reed beneath the whirlwind. Still, at his word, the guards had drawn themselves along the lower benches, on which the upper classes sat separate from the vulgar. They made but a feeble barrier. The waves of the human sea halted for a moment, to enable Arbaces to count the exact moment of his doom. In despair, and in a terror which beat down even pride, he glanced his eyes over the rolling and rushing crowd, when, right above them, through the wide chasm which had been left in the Valeria, he beheld a strange and awful apparition. He beheld, and his craft restored his courage. He stretched his hand on high. Over his lofty brow and royal features there came an expression of unutterable solemnity and command. Behold! he shouted with a voice of thunder, which stilled the roar of the crowd. Behold how the gods protect the guiltless! The fires of the avenging Orcus burst forth against the false witness of my accusers. The eyes of the crowd followed the gesture of the Egyptian, and beheld, with ineffable dismay, a vast vapor shooting from the summit of Vesuvius, in the form of a gigantic pine tree. The trunk, blackness. The branches, fire. A fire that shifted and wavered in its hues with every moment, now fiercely luminous, now of a dull and dying red that again blazed terrifically forth with intolerable glare. There was a dead, heart-sunken silence, through which there suddenly broke the roar of the lion, which was echoed back from within the building by the sharper and fiercer yells of its fellow beast. Dread seers were they of the burden of the atmosphere, and the wild prophets of the wrath to come. Then there arose on high the universal shrieks of women, the men stared at each other, but were dumb. At that moment they felt the earth shake beneath their feet, the walls of the theater trembled, and, beyond in the distance, they heard the crash of falling roofs. An instant more and the mountain clouds seemed to roll towards them, dark and rapid, like a torrent. At the same time it cast forth from its bosom a shower of ashes mixed with vast fragments of burning stone. Over the crushing vines, over the desolate streets, over the amphitheater itself, far and wide, with many a mighty splash in the agitated sea, fell that awful shower. No longer thought the crowd of justice or of arbaces. Safety for themselves was their sole thought. Each turned to fly, each dashing, pressing, crushing against the other, trampling recklessly over the fallen, amidst groans and oaths and prayers and sudden shrieks. The enormous crowd vomited itself forth through the numerous passages. Whither should they fly? Some, anticipating a second earthquake, hastened to their homes to load themselves with their more costly goods, and escape while it was yet time. Others, dreading the showers of ashes that now fell fast, torrent upon torrent, 
over the streets, rushed under the roofs of the nearest houses, or temples, or sheds, shelter of any kind, for protection from the terrors of the open air. But darker, and larger, and mightier, spread the cloud above them. It was a sudden and more ghastly night rushing upon the realm of noon. End of Book 5, Chapter 4book five chapter five of the last days of pompeii this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the last days of pompeii by edward g bulwer lytton book five chapter five the cell of the prisoner and the den of the dead grief unconscious of horror Stunned by his reprieve, doubting that he was awake, Glaucus had been led by the officers of the arena into a small cell within the walls of the theatre. They threw a loose robe over his form, and crowded round in congratulation and wonder. There was an impatient and fretful cry without the cell. The throng gave way, and the blind girl, led by some gentler hand, flung herself at the feet of Glaucus. It was I who have saved thee, she sobbed. Now let me die. Nydia, my child, my preserver. Oh, let me feel thy touch, thy breath. Yes, yes, thou livest. We are not too late. That dread door, methought it would never yield. And Calenus, oh, his voice was as the dying wind among tombs. We had to wait. Gods! It seemed hours ere food and wine restored to him something of strength. But thou livest, thou livest yet, and I, I have saved thee. This affecting scene was soon interrupted by the event just described. The mountain, the earthquake, resounded from side to side. The officers fled with the rest. They left Glaucus and Nydia to save themselves as they might. As the sense of the dangers around them flashed on the Athenian, his generous heart recurred to Olynthus. He, too, was reprieved from the tiger by the hand of the gods. Should he be left to a no less fatal death in the neighboring cell? Taking Nydia by the hand, Glaucus hurried across the passages. He gained the den of the Christian. He found Olynthus kneeling and in prayer. Arise, arise, my friend, he cried. Save thyself and fly. See, nature is thy dread deliverer. He led forth the bewildered Christian, and pointed to the cloud which advanced darker and darker, disgorging forth showers of ashes and pumice stones, and bade him hearken to the cries and trampling rush of the scattered crowd. This is the hand of God. God be praised, said Olynthus devoutly. Fly, seek thy brethren. Concert with them thy escape. Farewell. Olynthus did not answer, neither did he mark the retreating form of his friend. High thoughts and solemn absorbed his soul, and in the enthusiasm of his kindling heart he exulted in the mercy of God rather than trembled at the evidence of his power. At length he roused himself, and hurried on, he scarce knew whither. The open doors of a dark, desolate cell suddenly appeared on his path. Through the gloom within there flared and flickered a single lamp, and by its light he saw three grim and naked forms stretched on the earth in death. His feet were suddenly arrested, for, amidst the terror of that drear recess, the spolarium of the arena, he heard a low voice calling on the name of Christ. He could not resist lingering at that appeal. He entered the den and his feet were dabbled in the slow streams of blood that gushed from the corpses over the sand. Who, said the Nazarene, calls upon the Son of God? No answer came forth, and turning round, Olynthus beheld, by the light of the lamp, an old grey-headed man sitting on the floor, and supporting in his lap the head of one of the dead. The features of the dead man were firmly and rigidly locked in the last sleep, but over the lip there played a fierce smile, not the Christian's smile of hope, but the dark sneer of hatred and defiance. Yet on the face still lingered the beautiful roundness of early youth. 
the hair curled thick and glossy over the unwrinkled brow, and the down of manhood but slightly shaded the marble of the hueless cheek. And over this face bent one of such unutterable sadness, of such yearning tenderness, of such fawn and such deep despair. The tears of the old man fell fast and hot, but he did not feel them, and when his lips moved, and he mechanically uttered the prayer of his benign and hopeful faith, neither his heart nor his sense responded to the words. It was but the involuntary emotion that broke from the lethargy of his mind. His boy was dead, and had died for him, and the old man's heart was broken. Medan, said Olynthus, pityingly, arise and fly. God is forth upon the wings of the elements. The new Gomorrah is doomed. Fly, ere the fires consume thee. He was ever so full of life. He cannot be dead. Come hither. Place your hand on his heart. Sure it beats yet? Brother, the soul has fled. We will remember it in our prayers. Thou canst not reanimate the dumb clay. Come, come. Hark while I speak, yon crashing walls. Hark, yon agonizing cries. Not a moment is to be lost. Come. I hear nothing, said Meden, shaking his gray hair. The poor boy, his love murdered him. Come, come, forgive this friendly force. What? Who would sever the father from the son? And Meden clasped the body tightly in his embrace, and covered it with passionate kisses. Go, said he, lifting up his face for one moment. Go, we must be alone. Alas, said the compassionate Nazarene, death has severed ye already. The old man smiled very calmly. No, 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 muttered, his voice growing lower with each word. Death has been more kind. With that his head drooped to his son's breast, his arms relaxed their grasp. Olynthus caught him by the hand. The pulse had ceased to beat. The last words of the father were the words of truth. Death had been more kind. Meanwhile, Glaucus and Nydia were pacing swiftly up the perilous and fearful streets. The Athenian had learned from his preserver that Ione was yet in the house of Arbaces. Thither he fled, to release, to save her. The few slaves whom the Egyptian had left at his mansion when he had repaired in the long procession to the amphitheatre had been able to offer no resistance to the armed band of Sallust and when afterwards the volcano broke forth, they huddled together, stunned and frightened, in the inmost recesses of the house. Even the tall Ethiopian had forsaken his post at the door, and Glaucus, who left Nydia without, the poor Nydia, jealous once more, even in such an hour, passed on through the vast hall without meeting one from whom to learn the chamber of Ione. Even as he passed, however, the darkness that covered the heavens increased so rapidly that it was with difficulty that he could guide his steps. The flower-wreathed columns seemed to reel and tremble, and with every instant he heard the ashes fall cranchingly into the roofless peristyle. He ascended to the upper rooms. Breathless he paced along, shouting out aloud the name of Ione, and at length he heard, at the end of a gallery, a voice, her voice in wondering reply. To rush forward, to shatter the door, to seize Ione in his arms, to hurry from the mansion, seemed to him the work of an instant. Scarce had he gained the spot where Nydia was, than he heard the steps advancing towards the house, and recognized the voice of Arbaces, who had returned to seek his wealth and Ione ere he fled from the doomed Pompeii. But so dense was already the reeking atmosphere that the foes saw not each other, though so near, save that, dimly in the gloom, Glaucus caught the moving outline of the snowy robes of the Egyptian. They hastened onward, those three. Alas, whither? They now saw not a step before them. The blackness became utter. They were encompassed with doubt and horror, and the death he had escaped seemed to Glaucus only to have changed its form and augmented its victims. End of Book 5, Chapter 5
Book Five, Chapter Six of the Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulward Lytton. Book Five, Chapter Six. Calenus and Burbo, Diomed and Claudius, the girl of the amphitheatre and Julia. The sudden catastrophe which had, as it were, riven the very bonds of society, and left prisoner and jailer alike free, had soon rid Calenus of the guards to whose care the praetor had consigned him. And when the darkness and the crowd separated the priest from his attendants, he hastened with trembling steps towards the temple of his goddess. As he crept along, and ere the darkness was complete, he felt himself suddenly caught by the robe and a voice muttered in his ear, Hist! Calenus! An awful hour! I, by my father's head, who art thou? Thy face is dim, and thy voice is strange. No, not thy burbo? Fee! Gods! How the darkness gathers! Ho, ho! By yon terrific mountain, what sudden blazes of lightning! How they dart and quiver! Hades is loosed on earth! Tush! Thou believest not these things, Calenus. Now is the time to make our fortune. Ha! Listen, thy temple is full of gold and precious mummeries. Let us load ourselves with them, and then hasten to the sea and embark. None will ever ask an account of the doings of this day. Burbo, thou art right. Hush, and follow me into the temple. Who cares now? Who sees now? whether thou art priest or not. Follow, and we will share. In the precincts of the temple were many priests gathered around the altars, praying, weeping, groveling in the dust. Impostors in safety, they were not the less superstitious in danger. Calenus passed them, and entered the chamber yet to be seen in the south side of the court. Burbo followed him. The priests struck a light. Wine and viands strewed the table, the remains of a sacrificial feast. A man who has hungered forty-eight hours, muttered Calenus, has an appetite even in such a time. He seized on the food and devoured it greedily. Nothing could, perhaps, be more unnaturally horrid than the selfish baseness of these villains, for there is nothing more loathsome than the valor of avarice. Plunder and sacrilege, while the pillars of the world tottered to and fro. What an increase to the terrors of nature can be made by the vices of man. Wilt thou never have done, said Burbo, impatiently? Thy face purples, and thine eyes start already. It is not every day one has such a right to be hungry. O oh, Jupiter, what sound is that? The hissing of fiery water. What? Does the cloud give rain as well as flame? Ha! What? shrieks and burbo how silent all is now look forth amidst the other horrors the mighty mountain now cast up columns of boiling water blent and kneaded with the half-burning ashes the streams fell like seething mud over the streets in frequent intervals and full where the priests of isis had now cowered around the altars on which they had vainly sought to kindle fires and pour incense, one of the fiercest of those deadly torrents, mingled with immense fragments of scoria, had poured its rage. Over the bended forms of the priests it dashed. That cry had been of death, that silence had been of eternity. The ashes, the pitchy streams, sprinkled the altars, covered the pavement, and half concealed the quivering corpses of the priests. They are dead, said Burbo, terrified for the first time, and hurrying back into the cell. I thought not the danger was so near and fatal. The two wretches stood staring at each other. You might have heard their hearts beat. Calenus, the less bold by nature, but the more gripping, recovered first. We must to our task and away, he said, in a low whisper, frightened at his own voice. He stepped to the threshold, paused, crossed over the heated floor and his dead brethren to the sacred chapel, and called to Burbo to follow. But the gladiator quaked and drew back. 
So much the better, thought Calanus. The more will be my booty. Hastily he loaded himself with the more portable treasures of the temple, and thinking no more of his comrade, hurried from the sacred place. A sudden flash of lightning from the mount showed to Burbo, who stood motionless at the threshold, the flying and laden form of the priest. He took heart. He stepped forth to join him, when a tremendous shower of ashes fell right across his feet. The gladiator shrank back once more. Darkness closed him in. But the shower continued fast, fast. Its heaps rose high and suffocatingly. Deathly vapors steamed from them. The wretch gasped for breath. He sought in despair again to fly. The ashes had blocked up the threshold. He shrieked as his feet shrank from the boiling fluid. How could he escape? He could not climb to the open space. Nay, were he able, he could not brave its horrors. It were best to remain in the cells, protected, at least, from the fatal air. He sat down and clenched his teeth. By degrees, the atmosphere from without, stifling and venomous, crept into the chamber. He could endure it no longer. His eyes, glaring round, rested on a sacrificial axe, which some priest had left in the chamber. He seized it. With the desperate strength of his gigantic arm, he attempted to hew his way through the walls. Meanwhile, the streets were already thinned. The crowd had hastened to disperse itself under shelter. The ashes began to fill up the lower parts of the town. But, here and there, you heard the steps of fugitives cranching them warily, or saw their pale and haggard faces by the blue glare of the lightning, or the more unsteady glare of torches, by which they endeavored to steer their steps. But ever and anon, the boiling water, or the straggling ashes, mysterious and gusty winds, rising and dying in a breath, extinguished these wandering lights, and with them the last living hope of those who bore them. In the street that leads to the gate of Herculaneum, Claudius now bent his perplexed and doubtful way. If I can gain the open country, thought he, doubtless there will be various vehicles beyond the gate, and Herculaneum is not far distant. Thank Mercury! I have little to lose, and that little is about me. Hola! Help there! Help! cried a querulous and frightened voice. I have fallen down. My torch has gone out. My slaves have deserted me. I am Diomed, the rich Diomed. Ten thousand sesterces to him who helps me. At the same moment Claudius felt himself caught by the feet. Ill fortune to thee. Let me go, fool, said the gambler. Oh, help me up. Give me thy hand. There, rise. Is this Claudius? I know the voice. Whither fliest thou? Towards Herculaneum. Blessed be the gods. Our way is the same, then as far as the gate. Why not take refuge in my villa? Thou knowest the long range of subterranean cellars beneath the basement? That shelter, what shower can penetrate? You speak well, said Claudius musingly and by storing the cellar with food we can remain there even some days, should these wondrous storms endure so long. Oh, blessed be he who invented gates to a city, cried Diomed. See, they have placed a light within yon arch. By that let us guide our steps. The air was now still for a few minutes. The lamp from the gate streamed out far and clear. The fugitives hurried on. They gained the gate. They passed by the Roman sentry, the lightning flashed over his livid face and polished helmet, but his stern features were composed even in their awe. He remained erect and motionless at his post. That hour itself had not animated the machine of the ruthless majesty of Rome into the reasoning and self-acting man. There he stood, amidst the crashing elements. He had not received the permission to desert his station and escape. Diomed and his companion hurried on, when suddenly a female form rushed athwart their way. It was the girl whose ominous voice had been raised so often and so gladly in anticipation of the merry show. Oh, Diomed, she cried, shelter, shelter. See, pointing to an infant clasped to her breast, see this little one, it is mine, the child of shame. I have never owned it till this hour. But now I remember I am a mother. 
I have plucked it from the cradle of its nurse. She had fled. Who could think of the babe in such an hour but she who bore it? Save it! Save it! Curses on thy shrill voice! Away, harlot! muttered Claudius between his ground teeth. Nay, girl, said the more humane Diomed, follow if thou wilt. This way, this way, to the vaults. They hurried on. They arrived at the house of Diomed. They laughed aloud as they crossed the threshold, for they deemed the danger over. Diomed ordered his slaves to carry down into the subterranean gallery, before described, a profusion of food and oil for lights, and there Julia, Claudius, the mother and her babe, the greater part of the slaves, and some frightened visitors and clients of the neighborhood, sought their shelter. End of Book 5 Chapter 6《Book Five, Chapter Seven of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book Five, Chapter Seven The Progress of the Destruction. The cloud which had scattered so deep a murkiness over the day had now settled into a solid and impenetrable mass. It resembled less even the thickest gloom of a night in the open air than the close and blind darkness of some narrow room. But in proportion as the blackness gathered did the lightnings around Vesuvius increase in their vivid and scorching glare. Nor was their horrible beauty confined to the usual hues of fire no rainbow ever rivalled their varying and prodigal dyes, now brightly blue as the most azure depth of a southern sky, now of a livid and snake-like green, darting restlessly to and fro as the folds of an enormous serpent, now of a lurid and intolerable crimson gushing forth through the columns of smoke far and wide, and lighting up the whole city from arch to arch, then suddenly dying into a sickly paleness, like the ghost of their own life. In the pauses of the showers you heard the rumbling of the earth beneath, and the groaning waves of the tortured sea, or, lower still, and audible but to the watch of intensest fear, the grinding and hissing murmur of the escaping gases through the chasms of the distant mountain. Sometimes the cloud appeared to break from its solid mass, and, by the lightning, to assume quaint and vast mimicries of human or of monster shapes, striding across the gloom, hurtling one upon the other, and vanishing swiftly into the turbulent abyss of shade, so that, to the eyes and fancies of the affrighted wanderers, the unsubstantial vapours were as the bodily forms of gigantic foes, the agents of terror." And of death. The ashes in many places were already knee-deep, and the boiling showers which came from the steaming breath of the volcano forced their way into the houses, bearing with them a strong and suffocating vapour. In some places immense fragments of rock, hurled upon the house roofs, bore down along the street masses of confused ruin, which yet more and more with every hour obstructed the way, and as the day advanced, the motion of the earth was more sensibly felt, the footing seemed to slide and creep, nor could chariot or litter be kept steady even on the most level ground. Sometimes the huger stones, striking against each other as they fell, broke into countless fragments, emitting sparks of fire which caught whatever was combustible within their reach, and along the plains beyond the city the darkness was now terribly relieved for several houses and even vineyards had been set on flames, and at various intervals the fires rose suddenly and fiercely against the solid gloom. To add to this partial relief of the darkness, the citizens had here and there, in the more public places, such as the porticoes of temples and the entrances to the forum, endeavoured to place rows of torches, but these rarely continued long. The showers and the winds extinguished them, and the sudden darkness into which their sudden birth was converted had something in it doubly terrible and doubly impressing on the impotence of human hopes the lesson of despair. 
frequently, by the momentary light of these torches, parties of fugitives encountered each other, some hurrying towards the sea, others flying from the sea back to the land, for the ocean had retreated rapidly from the shore, an utter darkness lay over it, and upon its groaning and tossing waves the storm of cinders and rock fell without the protection which the streets and roofs afforded to the land. Wild, haggard, ghastly with supernatural fears, these groups encountered each other, but without the leisure to speak, to consult, to advise, for the showers fell now frequently, though not continuously, extinguishing the lights which showed to each band the death-like faces of the other, and hurrying all to seek refuge beneath the nearest shelter. The whole elements of civilization were broken up. Ever and anon, by the flickering lights, you saw the thief hastening by the most solemn authorities of the law, laden with, and fearfully chuckling over, the produce of his sudden gains. If in the darkness wife was separated from husband, or parent from child, vain was the hope of reunion. Each hurried blindly and confusedly on. Nothing in all the various and complicated machinery of social life was left, save the primal law of self-preservation. Through this awful scene did the Athenian wade his way, accompanied by Ione and the blind girl. Suddenly a rush of hundreds in their path to the sea swept by them. Nydia was torn from the side of Glaucus, who with Ione was borne rapidly onward, and when the crowd, whose forms they saw not, so thick was the gloom, were gone, Nydia was still separated from their side. Glaucus shouted her name. No answer came. They retraced their steps. In vain. They could not discover her. It was evident she had been swept along some opposite direction by the human current. Their friend, their preserver, was lost and hitherto Nydia had been their guide. Her blindness rendered the scene familiar to her alone. Accustomed through a perpetual night to thread the windings of the city, she had led them unerringly towards the seashore, by which they had resolved to hazard an escape. Now which way could they wend? All was rayless to them, a maze without a clue. Wearied, despondent, bewildered, they, however, passed along, the ashes falling upon their heads, the fragmentary stones dashing up in sparkles before their feet. Alas, alas, murmured Ione, I can go no farther. My steps sink among the scorching cinders. Fly, dearest, beloved, fly and leave me to my fate. Hush, my betrothed, my bride. Death with thee is sweeter than life without thee. Yet whither, oh, whither can we direct ourselves through the gloom? Already it seems that we have made but a circle and are in the very spot which we quitted an hour ago. Oh, gods, yon rock, see, it hath riven the roof before us. It is death to move through the streets. Blessed lightning, see, I only see, the portico of the Temple of Fortune is before us. Let us creep beneath it. It will protect us from the showers. He caught his beloved in his arms, and with difficulty and labour gained the temple. He bore her to the remoter and more sheltered part of the portico, and leaned over her that he might shield her with his own form from the lightning and the showers. The beauty and the unselfishness of love could hallow even that dismal time. Who is there? said the trembling and hollow voice of one who had preceded them into their place of refuge. Yet what matters? The crush of the ruined world forbids us to friends or foes. I only turned at the sound of the voice, and with a faint shriek cowered again beneath the arms of Glaucus, and he, looking in the direction of the voice, beheld the cause of her alarm. Through the darkness glared forth two burning eyes, the lightning flashed and lingered athwart the temple, and Glaucus, with a shudder, perceived the lion to which he had been doomed couched beneath the pillars, and close beside it, unwitting of the vicinity, lay the giant form of him who had accosted them, the wounded gladiator, Niger. 
that lightning had revealed to each other the form of beast and man, yet the instinct of both was quelled. Nay, the lion crept nearer and nearer to the gladiator as for companionship, and the gladiator did not recede or tremble. The revolution of nature had dissolved her lighter terrors as well as her wonted ties. While they were thus terribly protected, a group of men and women bearing torches passed by the temple. They were the congregation of the Nazarenes, and a sublime and unearthly emotion had not, indeed, quelled their awe, but it had robbed awe of fear. They had long believed, according to the error of the early Christians, that the last day was at hand. They imagined now that the day had come. "'Woe! woe!' cried in a shrill and piercing voice the elder at their head. "'Behold, the Lord descendeth to judgment. He maketh fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. Woe! woe! ye strong and mighty! Woe to ye of the Fasces and the purple! Woe to the idolater and the worshipper of the beast! Woe to ye who pour forth the blood of saints and gloat over the death pangs of the sons of God!' Woe to the harlot of the sea! Woe! Woe! And with a loud and deep chorus the troop chanted forth along the wild horrors of the air, Woe to the harlot of the sea! Woe! Woe! The Nazarenes paced slowly on, their torches still flickering in the storm, their voices still raised in menace and solemn warning, till, lost amid the windings in the streets, the darkness of the atmosphere and the silence of death again fell over the scene. There was one of the frequent pauses in the showers, and Glaucus encouraged Ione once more to proceed. Just as they stood, hesitating, on the last step of the portico, an old man with a bag in his right hand and leaning upon a youth tottered by. The youth bore a torch. Glaucus recognised the two as father and son, miser and prodigal. "'Father,' said the youth, "'if you cannot move more swiftly, I must leave you, or we both perish.' "'Fly, boy, then, and leave thy sire. "'But I cannot fly to starve. Give me thy bag of gold.' And the youth snatched at it. "'Wretch, wouldst thou rob thy father?' "'Aye, who can tell the tale in this hour? Miser, perish!' The boy struck the old man to the ground, plucked the bag from his relaxing hand, and fled onward with a shrill yell. "'Ye gods!' cried Glaucus. "'Are ye blind, then, even in the dark? Such crimes may well confound the guiltless with the guilty in one common ruin. I only on, on!' End of Book 5, Chapter 7book 5 chapter 8 of last days of pompeii this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org last days of pompeii by edward g bulwer lytton book 5 chapter 8 arbeques encounters glaucus and ione advancing as men grope for escape in a dungeon, Yone and her lover continued their uncertain way. At the moments when the volcanic lightnings lingered over the streets, they were enabled by that awful light to steer and guide their progress. Yet little did the view it presented to them cheer or encourage their path. In parts, where the ashes lay dry and uncommixed with the boiling torrents, cast upward from the mountain at capricious intervals, the surface of the earth presented a leprous and ghastly white. In other places, cinder and rock lay matted in heaps, from beneath which emerged the half-hid limbs of some crushed and mangled fugitive. The groans of the dying were broken by wild shrieks of woman's terror, now near, now distant, which, when heard in the utter darkness, were rendered doubly appalling by the crushing sense of helplessness and the uncertainty of the perils around and clear and distinct through all 
were the mighty and various noises from the fatal mountain, its rushing winds, its whirling torrents, and from time to time the burst and roar of some more fiery and fierce explosion. And ever as the winds swept howling along the street, they bore sharp streams of burning dust, and such sickening and poisonous vapors, as took away for the instant breath and consciousness, followed by a rapid revulsion of the arrested blood, and a tingling sensation of agony trembling through every nerve and fibre of the frame. O oh, Glaucus, my beloved, my own, take me to thy arms, one embrace, let me feel thy arms around me, and in that embrace let me die, I can no more. For my sake, for my life, courage yet, sweet Yone, my life is linked with thine, and see, torches, this way, lo, how they brave the wind, ha, they live through the storm, doubtless fugitives to the sea, we will join them. As if to aid and reanimate the lovers, the winds and showers came to a sudden pause, the atmosphere was profoundly still, the mountain seemed at rest, gathering perhaps fresh fury for its next burst. The torch-bearers moved quickly on. "'We are nearing the sea,' said in a calm voice the person at their head. "'Liberty and wealth to each slave who survives this day. Courage! I tell you that the gods themselves have assured me of deliverance. On!' Redly and steadily the torches flashed full on the eyes of Glaucus and Yone, who lay trembling and exhausted on his bosom. Several slaves were bearing by the light, panniers and coffers heavily laden. In front of them a drawn sword in his hand, towered the lofty form of Arbacis. "'By my father's cried the Egyptian. Fate smiles upon me even through these horrors, and amidst the dreadest aspects of woe and death, bodes me happiness and love. Away, Greek, I claim my word, Yone. "'Traitor and murderer!' cried Glaucus, glaring upon his foe. "'Nemesis has guided thee to my revenge, a just sacrifice to the shades of Hades, that now seem loosed on earth. Approach, touch but the hand of Yone, and thy weapon shall be as reed. I will tear thee limb for a limb.' Suddenly as he spoke, the place became lighted with an intense and lurid glow. Bright and gigantic through the darkness, which closed around it like the walls of hell, the mountain shone, a pile of fire. Its summit seemed riven in two, or rather, above its surface there seemed to rise two monster shapes, each confronting each, as demons contending for a world. These were of one deep blood red hue of fire, which lighted up the whole atmosphere far and wide. But below, the nether part of the mountain was still dark and shrouded, save in three places, down which flowed serpentine and irregular rivers of the molten lava. Darkly red through the profound gloom of their banks, they flowed slowly on, as towards the devoted city. Over the broadest there seemed to spring a cragged and stupendous arch, from which, as from the jaws of hell, gushed the sources of the southern phlegaton and through the stilled air was heard the rattling of the fragments of rock, hurtling one upon another as they were borne down the fiery cataracts, darkening for one instant the spot where they fell, and suffused the next in the burnished hues of a flood along which they floated. The slaves shrieked aloud, and covering hid their faces. The Egyptian himself stood transfixed to the spot, the glow lighting up his commanding features and jeweled robes. High behind him rose a tall column that supported the bronze statue of Augustus, and the imperial image seemed changed to a shape of fire. With his left hand circled round the form of Yone, with his right arm raised in menace, and grasping the stylus which was to have been his weapon in the arena, and which he still fortunately bore about him, with his brow knit, his lips apart, the wrath and menace of human passions arrested as by a charm upon his features, Glaucus fronted the Egyptian. Arbaces turned his eyes from the mountain. They rested on the form of Glaucus. He paused a moment. Why, he muttered, should I hesitate? 
did not the stars foretell the only crisis of imminent peril to which i was subjected is not that peril past the soul cried he aloud can brave the wreck of worlds and the wrath of imaginary gods by that soul will i conquer to the last advance slaves athenian resist me and thy blood be on thine own head thus then i regain yone he advanced one step it was his last on earth the ground shook beneath him with a convulsion that cast all around upon its surface a simultaneous crash resounded through the city as down toppled many a roof and pillar the lightning as if caught by the metal lingered an instant on the imperial statue then shivered bronze and column down fell the ruin echoing along the street and ribbing the solid pavement where it crashed the prophecy of the stars was fulfilled the sound the shock stunned the athenian for several moments when he recovered the light still illuminated the scene the earth still slid and trembled beneath yone lay senseless on the ground but he saw her not yet his eyes were fixed upon a ghastly face that seemed to emerge without limbs or trunk from the huge fragments of the scattered column a face of unutterable pain agony and despair the eyes shut and opened rapidly as if sense were not yet fled the lips quivered and grinned then sudden stillness and darkness fell over the features yet retaining that aspect of horror never to be forgotten so perished the wise magician the great arbaikis the hermes of the burning belt the last of the royalty of egypt end of book five chapter eight book five chapter nine of last days of pompeii this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. last days of pompeii by edward g bulwer luton book five chapter nine the despair of the lovers the condition of the multitude Glaucus turned in gratitude, but in awe, caught Yone once more in his arms, and fled along the street that was yet intensely luminous. But suddenly a duller shade fell over the air. Instinctively he turned to the mountain, and beheld one of the two gigantic crests into which the summit had been divided, rocked and wavered to and fro, and then with a sound the mightiness of which no language can describe it fell from its burning base and rushed an avalanche of fire down the sides of the mountain at the same instant gushed forth a volume of blackest smoke rolling on over air sea and earth another and another and another shower of ashes far more profuse than before scattered fresh desolation along the streets Darkness once more wrapped them as a veil, and Glaucus, his bold heart at last quelled and despairing, sank beneath the cover of an arch, and clasping Yone to his heart, a bride on that couch of ruin, resigned himself to die. Meanwhile Nydia, when separated by the strong from Glaucus and Yone, had in vain endeavoured to regain them. In vain she raised the plaintive cry so peculiar to the blind, it was lost amidst the thousand shrieks of more selfish terror again and again she returned to the spot where they had been divided to find her companions gone to seize every fugitive to inquire of glaucus to be dashed aside in the impatience of distraction who in that hour spared one thought to his neighbour perhaps in scenes of universal horror nothing is more horrid than the unnatural selfishness they engender at length it occurred to Nydia that as it had been resolved to seek the seashore for escape, her most probable chance of rejoining her companions 
would be to persevere in that direction. Guiding her steps, then, by the staff which she always carried, she continued, with incredible dexterity, to avoid the masses of ruin that encumbered the path, to thread the streets, and unerringly, so blessed now was that accustomed darkness, so afflicting in ordinary life, to take the nearest direction to the seaside. Poor girl! Her courage was beautiful to behold, and fate seemed to favor one so helpless. The boiling torrents touched her not, save by the general rain which accompanied them. The huge fragments of scoria shivered the pavement before and beside her, but spared that frail form, and when the lesser ashes fell over her, she shook them away with a slight tremor and dauntlessly resumed her course. Weak, exposed, yet fearless, supported but by one wish, she was the very emblem of Psyche in her wanderings, of hope, walking through the valley of the shadow, of the soul itself, lone but undaunted, amidst the dangers and the snares of life. Her path was, however, constantly impeded by the crowds that now groped amidst the gloom, now fled in the temporary glare of the lightnings across the scene, and at length, a group of torch-bearers rushing full against her, she was thrown down with some violence. "'What?' said the voice of one of the party. "'Is this the brave blind girl? By Bacchus, she must not be left here to die. Up, my Thessalian. So-so. Are you hurt? That's well. Come along with us. We are for the shore.' O oh, Sallust, is it thy voice? The gods be thanked. Glaucus, 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 have ye seen him? Not I. He is doubtless out of the city by this time. The gods who saved him from the lion will save him from the burning mountain. As the kindly epicure thus encouraged Nydia, he drew her along with him towards the sea, heeding not her passionate entreaties, that he would linger yet a while to search for Glaucus. And still is the accent of despair, she continued to shriek out that beloved name, which amidst all the roar of the convulsed elements kept alive a music at her heart. The sudden illumination, the burst of the floods of lava, and the earthquake, which we have already described, chanced when Sallust and his party had just gained the direct path leading from the city to the port, and here they were arrested by an immense crowd, more than half the population of the city. They spread along the field without the walls, thousands upon thousands, uncertain whither to fly. The sea had retired far from the shore, and they who had fled to it had been so terrified by the agitation and preternatural shrinking of the element, the gasping forms of the uncouth sea-things, which the waves had left upon the sand, and by the sound of the huge stones cast from the mountain into the deep, that they had returned again to the land, as presenting the less frightful aspect of the two. Thus the two streams of human beings, the one seaward, the other from the sea, had met together, feeling a sad comfort in numbers, arrested in despair and doubt. "'The world is to be destroyed by fire,' said an old man in long loose robes, a philosopher of the Stoic school. Stoic and Epicurean wisdom have alike agreed in this prediction, and the hour is come. Yea, the hour is come, cried a loud voice, solemn but not fearful. Those around turned in dismay. The voice came from above them. It was the voice of Olynthus, who, surrounded by his Christian friends, stood upon an abrupt eminence on which, the old Greek colonists had raised a temple to Apollo, now time-worn and half in ruin. As he spoke there came that sudden illumination which had heralded the death of Arbaces, and glowing over that mighty multitude, aved, crouching, breathless, never on earth had the faces of men seemed so haggard, never had meeting of mortal beings been so stamped with the horror and sublimity of dread. Never till the last trumpet sounds shall such meeting be seen again. And above those the form of Olynthus, with outstretched arm and prophet brow, girt with the living fires. 
and the crowd knew the face of him they had doomed to the fangs of the beast, then their victim, now their warner, and through the stillness again came his ominous voice, The hour is come. The Christians repeated the cry. It was caught up. It was echoed from side to side. Woman and man, childhood and old age, repeated, not aloud but in a smothered and dreary murmur, The hour is come. At that moment a wild yell burst through the air, and thinking only of escape, whither it knew not, the terrible tiger of the desert leaped amongst the throng, and hurried through its parted streams. And so came the earthquake, and so darkness once more fell over the earth. And now new fugitives arrived, grasping the treasures no longer destined for their lord. The slaves of Arbaquis joined the throng, one only of all their torches yet flickered on, it was borne by Sosia, and its light falling on the face of Nidia, he recognized the Scythalian. "'What avails thy liberty now, blind girl?' said the slave. "'Who art thou? Canst thou tell me of Glaucus?' "'Ay, I saw him but a few minutes since.' "'Blessed be thy head! Where?' "'Crouched beneath the arch of the forum, dead or dying, gone to rejoin Arbaces, who is no more.' Nidia uttered not a word. She slid from the side of Sallust. Silently she glided through those behind her, and retraced her steps to the city. She gained the forum, the arch, she stooped down, she felt round, she called on the name of Glaucus. A weak voice answered, Who calls on me? Is it the voice of the Shades? Lo, I am prepared. Arise, follow me, take my hand. Glaucus, thou shalt be saved. In wonder and sudden hope, Glaucus arose. Nidia still. Ah, thou then are safe. The tender joy of his voice pierced the heart of the poor Thessalian, and she blessed him for his thought of her. Half leading, half carrying Yone, Glaucus followed his guide. With admirable discretion she avoided the pass which led to the crowd she had just quitted, and by another route sought the shore. After many pauses and incredible perseverance, they gained the sea, and joined a group, who, bolder than the rest, resolved to hazard any peril rather than continue in such a scene. In darkness they put forth to sea, but as they cleared the land and caught new aspects of the mountain, its channels of molten fire, threw a partial redness over the waves. Utterly exhausted and worn out, Yone slept on the breast of Glaucus, and Nidia lay at his feet. Meanwhile the showers of dust and ashes, still borne aloft, fell into the wave, and scattered their snows over the deck. Far and wide, borne by the winds, those showers descended upon the remotest climes, startling even the swarthy African, and whirled along the antique soil of Syria and of Egypt, Dion Cassius. End of Book 5, Chapter 9。Book 5, Chapter 10 of Last Days of Pompeii。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Buller Lytton. Book 5, Chapter 10. The Next Morning, The Fate of Nydia. And meekly, softly, beautifully dawned at last the light over the trembling deep. The winds were sinking into rest. The foam died from the glowing azure of that delicious sea. Around the east, thin mists caught gradually the rosy hues that heralded the morning. Light was about to resume her reign. Yet still, dark and massive in the distance, lay the broken fragments of the destroying cloud, from which red streaks, burning dimlier and more dim, betrayed the yet rolling fires of the mountain of the scorched fields. 
the white walls and gleaming columns that had adorned the lovely coasts, were no more. Sullen and dull were the shores so lately crested by the cities of Herculaneum and Pompeii. The darlings of the deep were snatched from her embrace. Century after century shall the mighty mother stretch forth her azure arms, and know them not, moaning round the sepulchres of the lost. There was no shout from the mariners at the dawning light. It had come too gradually, and they were too wearied for such sudden bursts of joy. But there was a low, deep murmur of thankfulness amidst those watchers of the long night. They looked at each other and smiled. They took heart. They felt once more that there was a world around and a God above them. And in the feeling that the worst was past, the over-wearied ones turned round and fell placidly to sleep. In the growing light of the skies there came the silence which night had wanted, and the bark drifted calmly onward to its port. A few other vessels bearing similar fugitives might be seen in the expanse, apparently motionless, yet gliding also on. There was a sense of security, of companionship, and of hope, in the sight of their slender masts and white sails. What beloved friends, lost and missed in the gloom, might they not bear to safety and to shelter? In the silence of the general sleep, Nydia rose gently. She bent over the face of Glaucus, she inhaled the deep breath of his heavy slumber, timidly and sadly she kissed his brow, his lips. She felt for his hand, it was locked in that of Ione. She sighed deeply and her face darkened. Again she kissed his brow and with her hair wiped from it the damps of night. May the gods bless you, Athenian, she murmured. May you be happy with your beloved one. May you sometimes remember Nydia. Alas, she is of no further use on earth. With these words she turned away. Slowly she crept along by the fori or platforms to the farther side of the vessel, and pausing, bent low over the deep. The cool spray dashed upward on her feverish brow. It is the kiss of death, said she. It is welcome. The balmy air played through her waving tresses. She put them from her face, and raised those eyes, so tender though so lightless, to the sky whose soft face she had never seen. No, no, she said, half aloud, and in a musing and thoughtful tone, I cannot endure it, this jealous, exacting love. It shatters my whole soul in madness. I might harm him again, wretch that I was. I have saved him, twice saved him. Happy, happy thought. Why not die happy? It is the last glad thought I can ever know. O oh, sacred sea, I hear thy voice invitingly. It hath a freshening and joyous call. They say that in thy embrace is dishonour, that thy victims cross not the fatal sticks. Be it so. I would not meet him in the shades, for I should meet him still with her. Rest, rest, rest. There is no other Elysium for a heart like mine. A sailor half dozing on the deck heard a slight splash on the waters. Drowsily he looked up, and behind, as the vessel merrily bounded on, he fancied he saw something white above the waves, but it vanished in an instant. He turned round again, and dreamed of his home and children. When the lovers awoke, their first thought was of each other, their next of Nydia. She was not to be found, none had seen her since the night. Every crevice of the vessel was searched, there was no trace of her. Mysterious from first to last, the blind Thessalian had vanished for ever from the living world. They guessed her fate in silence. And Glaucus and Ione, while they drew nearer to each other, feeling each other the world itself, 
forgot their deliverance, and wept as for a departed sister. End of Book 5, Chapter 10「Book Five, Chapters the Last, of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Last the Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book Five, Chapters the Last, Where in All Things Cease. Letter from Glaucus to Sallust ten years after the destruction of Pompeii. Athens. Glaucus to his beloved Sallust. Greeting and health. You request me to visit you at Rome. No, Sallust, come rather to me at Athens. I have forsworn the imperial city, its mighty tumult and hollow joys. In my own land henceforth I dwell for ever. The ghost of our departed greatness is dearer to me, than the gaudy life of your loud prosperity. There is a charm to me which no other spot can supply, in the porticos hallowed still by holy and venerable shades. In the olive groves of Ilysses I still hear the voice of poetry. On the heights of Phile, the clouds of twilight, seem yet the shrouds of departed freedom. The heralds, the heralds of the morrow that shall come, you smile at my enthusiasm, Sallust. Better be hopeful in chains than resign to their glitter. You tell me you are sure that I cannot enjoy life in these melancholy haunts of a fallen majesty. You dwell with rapture in the Roman splendors and the luxuries of the imperial court. My Sallust, non sum qualis eram, I am not what I was. The events of my life have sobered the bounding blood of my youth. My health has never quite recovered its wonted elasticity, ere it felt the pangs of disease, and languished in the damps of a criminal's dungeon. My mind has never shaken off the dark shadow of the last day of Pompeii, the horror and the desolation of that awful ruin. Our beloved, our remembered Nydia, I have reared a tomb to her shade, and I see it every day from the window of my study. It keeps alive in me a tender recollection, a not unpleasing sadness, which are but a fitting homage to her fidelity, and the mysteriousness of her early death. Yone gathers the flowers, but my own hand raises them daily around the tomb. She has worthy of a tomb in Athens. You speak of the growing sect of the Christians in Rome. Sallust, to you I may confide my secret. I have pondered much over that face. I have adopted it. After the destruction of Pompeii, I met once more with Olynthus, saved, alas, only for a day, and falling afterwards a martyr to the indomitable energy of his zeal. In my preservation from the lion and the earthquake, he taught me to behold the hand of the unknown God. I listened, believed, adored. My own, my more than ever beloved Yone, has also embraced the creed. A creed, Sallust, which shedding light over this world, gathers its concentrated glory, like a sunset over the next. We know that we are united in the soul, as in the flesh, for ever and for ever. Ages may roll on, our very dust be dissolved, the earth shriveled like a scroll, but round and round the circle of eternity rolls the wheel of life, imperishable, unceasing. And as the earth from the sun, so immortality drinks happiness from virtue, which is the smile upon the face of God. Visit me, then, Sallust, bring with you the learned scrolls of Epicurus, Pythagoras, Diogenes. Arm yourself for defeat, and let us, amidst the groves of Academus, dispute, under a surer guide than any granted to our fathers, on the mighty problem of the true ends of life and the nature of the soul. Yone, at that name my heart yet beats, Yone is by my side as I write. I lift my eyes and meet her smile. The sunlight quivers over Hymetus. 
and along my garden I hear the hum of the summer bees. Am I happy, ask you? Oh, what can Rome give me equal to what I possess at Athens? Here everything awakens the soul and inspires the affections. The trees, the waters, the hills, the skies are those of Athens, fair, though mourning mother, of the poetry and the wisdom of the world. In my hall I see the marble faces of my ancestors. In the Keramicus I survey their tombs. In the streets I behold the hand of Phidias and the soul of Pericles. Harmodius, Aristogiton, they are everywhere, but in our hearts. In mine at least they shall not perish. If anything can make me forget that I am an Athenian and not free, it is partly the soothing, the love, watchful, vivid, sleepless, of Yone, a love that has taken a new sentiment in our new creed, a love which none of our poets, beautiful though they be, had shadowed forth in description. For mingled with religion, it partakes of religion. It is blended with pure and unworldly thoughts. It is that which we may hope to carry through eternity, and keep therefore white and unsullied, that we may not blush to confess it to our God. This is the true type of the dark fable of our Grecian Eros and Psyche. It is, in truth, the soul asleep in the arms of love. And if this our love support me partly against the fever of the desire for freedom, my religion supports me more, for whenever I would grasp the sword and sound the shell, and rush to new marathon, but marathon without victory, I feel my despair at the chilling thought of my country's impotence, the crushing weight of the Roman yoke, comforted at least by the thought that earth is but the beginning of life, that the glory of a few years matters little in the vast space of eternity, that there is no perfect freedom till the chains of clay fall from the soul, and all space, all time, become its heritage and domain. Yet Sallust, some mixture of the soft Greek blood, still mingles with my faith. I can share not the zeal of those who see crime and eternal wrath in men, who cannot believe as they. I shudder not at the creed of others. I dare not curse them. I pray the great father to convert. This lukewarmness exposes me to some suspicion amongst the Christians, but I forgive it, and not offending openly the prejudices of the crowd, I am thus enabled to protect my brethren from the danger of the law, and the consequences of their own zeal. If moderation seem to me the natural creature of benevolence, it gives also the greatest scope to beneficence. Such then, O Sallust, is my life, such my opinions. In this manner I greet existence and await death. And though, glad-hearted and kindly pupil of Epicurus, though, but come hither, and see what enjoyments, what hopes are ours, and not the splendor of imperial banquets, nor the shouts of the crowded circus, nor the noisy forum, nor the glittering theatre, nor the luxuriant gardens, nor the voluptuous baths of Rome, shall seem to thee to constitute a life of more vivid and uninterrupted happiness than that which thou so unreasonably pitiest as the career of Glaucus the Athenian. Farewell. Nearly seventeen centuries had rolled away when the city of Pompeii was disinterred from its silent tomb, all vivid with undimmed hues, its walls fresh as if painted yesterday, not a hue faded on the rich mosaic of its floors, in its forum the half-finished columns as left by the workman's hand, in its gardens the sacrificial tripod, in its halls the chest of treasure, in its baths the strigil, in its theatre the counter of admission, in its saloons the furniture and the lamp, in its triclinia the fragments of the last feast, in its cubicula the perfumes and the rogue of faded beauty, and everywhere the bones and skeletons of those who once moved the springs of that minute yet gorgeous machine of luxury and of life. In the house of Diomed, in the subterranean vaults, twenty skeletons, one of a babe, were discovered in one spot by the door, 
covered by a fine ashen dust that had evidently been wafted through slowly through the apertures until it had filled the whole space there were jewels and coins candelabra for an availing light and wine hardened in the amphora for a prolongation of agonized life the sand consolidated by damps had taken the forms of the skeletons as in a cast and the traveller may yet see the impression of a female neck and bosom of young and round proportions the trace of the fated julia it seems to the inquirer as if the air had been gradually changed into a sulphurous vapour the inmates of the vaults had rushed to the door to find it closed and blocked up by the scoria without and in their attempts to force it had been suffocated with the atmosphere in the garden was found a skeleton with a key by its bony hand and near it a bag of coins this is believed to have been the master of the house the unfortunate diomed who had probably sought to escape by the garden and been destroyed either by the vapours or some fragment of stone besides some silver vases lay another skeleton probably of the slave the houses of Sallust and of Panza, the temple of Isis, with the juggling concealments behind the statues, the larking place of its holy oracles, are now bared to the gaze of the curious. In one of the chambers of that temple was found a huge skeleton with an axe beside it. Two walls had been pierced by the axe. The victim could penetrate no further. In the midst of the city was found another skeleton, by the side of which was a heap of coins, and many of the mystic ornaments of the fane of Isis. Death had fallen upon him in his avarice, and Calanus perished simultaneously with Burbo. As the excavators cleared on through the mass of ruin, they found the skeleton of a man, literally severed in two by a prostrate column. The skull was of so striking a conformation so boldly marked in its intellectual as well as its worst physical developments, that it has excited the constant speculation of every itinerant believer in the theories of Sportsheim, who has gazed upon that ruined palace of the mind. Still, after the lapse of ages, the traveller may survey that airy hall within whose cunning galleries and elaborate chambers once sought, reasoned, dreamed, and sinned, the soul of Arbekis, the Egyptian. Viewing the various witnesses of a social system which has passed from the world by ever, a stranger, from that remote and barbarian isle which the imperial Roman shivered when he named, posed amidst the delights of the soft Campania and composed this history. End of Book 5, Chapter the Last And this is also the end of the last days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer-Lytton